the, the outlandish, the weird version by DDLI or the, 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 the documentary approach, the real approach. Um, how did you, where are you between these polarities? Um, you know, I actually came to North Korea via this documentary called, I mean, I actually knew where it was, and I, I knew about it, but I developed this uh, fascination with the country thanks to this documentary called Crossing the Line. Have you ever seen it? I mean, it's about these four American soldiers who crossed the DMZ during the Korean War and vanished into North Korea. Is it a fiction film? Was it a no, no, it's a documentary. documentary. Yeah, and um, it's in particular about one of these guys, Dresnok, and how he's been living in North Korea for the last 30 years with a Korean wife. And of course, the Koreans want to imagine that they have been in assimilated into North Korea and very much believe in Juche and North Korean ideology. And the Americans just want to say they're being held there against their will. And I'm so amazed by the story of these four. Um, soldiers, particularly because they became huge stars of North Korean cinema. They started playing these Western agents of evil in uh, a movie, in several movies, but one of them was called um, Nameless Heroes. And it was a 22 hour film in which essentially the North Koreans run around um, trying to defend themselves against the American um, perpetrators and baby killers and wolf hunters who basically kill with impunity. They just run around North Korea and they're killing everybody all the time. This is the plot for 22 hours. And the Americans are featured quite prominently, so they became very famous. And Kim Jong-il being, or he was, you know, a huge movie buff. And so he was very attracted to these four. And uh, somehow in my mind, I, there was a whole extra like 100 pages in this novel about these four soldiers. And, it all ended up on the cutting room floor. None of it worked. But that is how I ended up getting interested in, in North Korea. And then, of course, the more I read about it, the more horrified I, I was. There's a wonderful book called Aquariums of Young Men, which is about somebody that spent a good deal of his childhood in one of the labor camps. And there are many books like this that are being, that have been translated and smuggled out. Because the dissident movement in North Korea is actually alive and well. And that too is quite engaging. Watch these people with their little bike, their little cameras, and briefcases wandering around the outskirts of town. So you put that all together and you get a little North Korea. Um, Thurlow Jam, the Helix leader, in my eyes, isn't so much a charismatic leader than a sorry sap. He's a <laughs> cartoonish type of person. And Esme, his ex wife, uh, wearing her wigs and artificial faces as she's a spy on him, is somebody who would never make it into the CIA. Uh, so how do you conceive the so-called suspension of disbelief uh, for the characters? Well, I hope it's worked. You know, I mean, she, he... Did you, did you think about this? What was the problem? Well, you know, I, I was trying to figure out how one becomes a cult leader. You know, how do you, how do you become a cult leader? I was like, is there a book out there? You know, step one, step two. There's one, like, really goofy YouTube video about what you have to do to become a cult leader. So I had no idea. So part of the fun of the book was trying to imagine this guy making a videotape. He makes this kind of farewell videotape in which he narrates how he actually became who he is. I mean, don't you wonder? You know, how does Charles Manson become Charles Manson? You know, how does Crash, how do you get there? Mm. So even just trying to imagine a, a even remotely plausible trajectory for a guy like this was complicated. But of course, to make him interesting, I had to sort of make him somewhat self-loathing and pathetic and an unlikely character for this role. And Esme, is, she's a freelance mercenary, is what she is, a sleuthing mercenary. Um, people like her exist, actually, in fact. Um, I read a lot of books about women in the CIA and the FBI and what their training is and how they're recruited, and I actually did want there to be a high degree of plausibility for her, although she's more like one of these Blackwell people, you know, like a private for hire contractor. I mean, she originally in the book she had been with the CIA, and then she has this big orgy in Australia on this listening base, and the orgy ends up ruining one of the master tapes of the North Korean foreign minister before the talks with President Carter, the agreed framework talks in the 90s. So she's thrown out of the CIA because of the orgy, but she she made it there to begin with. I think we shouldn't give away too much of the story, but in the end we will find out that there's something like a Stockholm Syndrome developing. Uh, is that everything that's left, solidarity between the kidnappers and the kidnap, between the brainwashers and the brainwashed, between the victims and the perpetrators? Well, this is true. I mean, the novel ends with four short stories, which to me felt like a bit of a risky move, because the four short stories don't talk to each other. They do thematically, but not plot-wise, so each 
what I read was sort of a good chunk of one of the last short stories. Um, and all those stories are supposed to function as sort of paths away from estrangement. Like if you're not in some loony cult, what do you have to do to march away from that sense of sort of congenital estrangement from your friends and family and your beloved ones? And so I'm not sure that it's so much a Stockholm syndrome develops between the victims and the perpetrators, so much as a sense that at least the mandate for this cult is honorable and um, valuable. And if the cult isn't going to do it, what else can we do? And so obviously the kidnapping ends up being kind of a good deal for, well, at least three of the four of them. <coughs> Thanks for the moment. I'll get back to you after I talk to Karen. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the story you're going to read is called The Graveless Doll of Aaron Mutis, and it's a perfect example for your artist storytelling. It combines a first-person coming-of-age first coming narrative with an Edgar Allan Poe-like quality. And through the eyes of a 40-year-old uh, boy, Larry Rubio, we encounter questions of guilt and the uncanny and almost Freudian way. When you're trying to slip into the mind of a character like Larry Rubio, can you tell whether it's rather remembering your own youth or, project, or projecting the adult perspective into him? I think a little bit of both. And I was excited to read this with Fiona because one of the things I admire so much about her writing is that her characters are fully dimensioned characters and they're not, um, they're not completely puppy dog likable. You know, she really does not shy away. When we were talking about um, the unbearable truth, I think one of them that Fiona comes at um, in Noonlight frequently is just the fact that we're going to die. You know, that, that, that's a pretty, that's a present one in all of her work. And so I, I wanted to pick something a little darker. I often have these adolescent characters who are quite sympathetic, and I think Larry is, is less so. Um, and um, I was, he's a, he's a bully essentially, which I, I never was. I would have been on the other end of that equation when I was a kid. Um, so I think part of it, in this story more than others, I think it's retrospective. It's an adult looking back and trying to make sense of who he was at that time, you know, why he did the things he did. Okay, before you start, could you please outline the story a bit, because it takes some complicated twists and turns in the end. Yes, And we'll just hear the beginning. And I'm afraid we just hear the beginning, yeah. But thank you uh, so much for that beautiful introduction. I think this one for me, I really wanted to see how long I could prolong this uncanny hesitation. So. These, a bunch of kids, I, all of my stuff also tends to be set like in some more fairy tale-ish environment. You know, there's always like a, a big moon in the ocean or, you know, something. So here I thought I would set it in a really shitty urban environment, which I'd never done before. So it's the city of Anthem in New Jersey. Um, my big joke is that I never set stories in New Jersey, so I thought I would just try doing that. And they go to their urban green space, you know, their woods, these four kids. They call it Camp Dark and they discover the doll of a boy tied to a tree. Um, and he looks really familiar. It takes them a little while to put together that it's this boy that they used to abuse, essentially, systematically at school, Eric Mutis. Um, and this story, I guess the, bio the biographical part is that there was a boy named Nicholas Mutis in my grade school who, I mean, I, I, I pretty God he doesn't read this story, actually. Um, but who everyone was, uh, was so cruel to, and everyone was involved in the cruelty. If you weren't a perpetrator, I, w I mean, I, I was a bystander, right? Because we're all like 10 or something. But everyone is complicit in this kind of cruelty, in a way, right? It, it touched everybody. So, um, so for me, the story was about the kind of lasting mark that that leaves. Um, and there are some complicated twists. I guess, I guess what's complicated about it is it's tough to pin down exactly what's going on because the narrator is unreliable. In a sense, he doesn't truly know either, and his vision is very much infected and inflected by his own guilt. So he, he can't really clearly see, none of these kids can really clearly see what's happening in the park, except that it does seem like they found a doll of the boy that they used to torture and then promptly forgot about. I was thinking, too, um, a friend of mine helped me write this story, and we would talk frequently about how there was always that kid who shows up in the middle of the school year, He's really pale and weird. No one knows anything about his home life. And then he's like gone again in May, and no one really, you know, it's, it just sort of um, feels, that feels quite uncanny. It feels like an apparition. They never feel fully material. So um, I don't know if that's enough of a, a wind up. They keep going to this park, and this dog keeps disappearing incrementally. And three of the kids in this gang believe that Larry Rubio, the protagonist, is dismantling the dolls like a prank to freak them out taking pieces of it back to his house. And Larry, who's narrating the story, knows that he's absolutely, or d d doesn't 